Harlan Ulman, emekli bir deniz subayı. Tekne kaptanı olarak Vietnam Savaşı'nda 150'den fazla muharebe devriyesine ve operasyonuna liderlik etti. Soğuk savaş sırasında ve sonrasında ABD stratejisinin formülasyonuna dahil oldu. Şok ve dehşet doktrininin yaratıcısıydı. ABD Dışişleri ve Savunma Bakanlarına, NATO Stratejik Komutanlarına ve NATO Genel Sekreterlerine, ayrıca kongre üyelerine ve Avrupa'da ve Pasifik bölgesinde bir dizi yabancı hükümet başkanına aktif olarak danışmanlık yaptı. I was present at his speech. One of the problems or one of the realities that your viewers need to understand is that the US government is not working very well. Uh, both parties cannot lead or rule and almost every issue is politically divided 51-50, 49.5-51.5. So the country is in a great state of, of political confusion. The speech that you referred to that Mr. Sullivan gave had a single point that has been missed. He said, and this was confirmed later in another speech by Ambassador Nick Burns, who's our ambassador to Beijing and China, that Bush, that Biden's foreign policy is foreign policy for the middle class. And Mr. Sullivan went into great detail explaining how the Build Back America Act of 2021 and the recent acts that were passed science and technology the chips act and the uh, inflation reduction act are all designed to help the middle class and our foreign policy is largely oriented towards the middle class the question is however what about those of us who are not in the middle class and so i think there's an inherent contradiction in the foreign policy as stated by overly focusing on the so-called middle class. This needs to be a foreign policy that preserves the sovereignty, the integrity, the security, the prosperity of the United States and its allies, partners, period. So I'm not happy with that statement. The fundamental issue is that the United States is divided on China. Virtually all members of Congress, both parties, both sides of the aisle, both houses, see China as an existential threat. And they're making that argument. However, when you ask what is the real threat that China poses, the first argument is, well, they're going to invade Taiwan. Well, the fact of the matter is, as the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff here, General Mark Milley, says, China does not have the capability to launch and will not have the capability to launch a Normandy style, and we're close to the celebration of Normandy, June 6th, coming up, with 200,000 soldiers and 6,000 ships and small craft. China is not going to do that. So when you say, what is the real threat? It's difficult uh, to get a good answer. People will say, well, China wants to take over the international environment. No, they don't. They understand their limitations. Yes, they'd like to see the renminbi, the yuan, become the reserve currency. There's huge advantage. So I think we have to be very careful in how we view China. And others will say, look, China has the largest navy in the world. Well, if you use the same ship count that we're using to include rather than small ships, by that metric, the largest Navy in the world is the U.S. Army because of the Corps of Engineers that has a lot of these smaller vessels. And anybody, if asked, would you trade the U.S. Navy for the Chinese Navy, would say, of course not. So the fundamental answer to your question is that our foreign policy of the Biden administration is for the middle class. I think that's too narrow. I think we're making China too much into an enemy, uh, overstating their strengths and ignoring or missing their weaknesses, which are many. And we can go into the many weaknesses of China. So I'm not very, very happy with this uh, policy. And I also think that becoming more protectionist is not a good idea. China is trying to establish its rules of the game. And fair enough. Why, given the fact that it has such a huge economy, does it want to play by Western rules? And now for the large number of people in the so-called South, Africa, South America, Asia, uh, who were either raised under a colonial government and resent it, resent the West, or resent being badly treated by the United States, they're certainly going to side with China. And so this is something I think that the administration has to take it more, more seriously and put in place measures that will be able to exploit its positions. And it requires far better diplomacy with a lot more countries.
Now, here's a problem. <clears throat> Getting people confirmed is very difficult in the Senate. We only just sent an ambassador to Russia. This is madness. And it's one of the problems of the system that we do not have the diplomatic capacity, not because we don't want to have it, but just because of the bureaucratic and political situations here. And so you raise an enormously um, perceptive question because China and indeed to some degree Russia are going to exploit that. And for example, by sheer numbers, the numbers of global of, of people, so more people support Russia in Ukraine than support NATO in the West. And this is something that China is very clever. China does not have some of the bureaucratic problems the United States has. Most of its ambassadors <clears throat> are extremely qualified, very experienced, and have held some significant positions domestically inside China so they can balance the political with the international. And so this is something I think that the United States is going to have to improve its game because this is an issue, you're absolutely right, and other countries are going to exploit these differences. And I think that we need to be better able to deal with those. And so we have to focus on them along with China and Russia. And the way to do that is not to overly militarize the threat. The way is how do you work in terms of common interest of which the environment, maintaining global stability and other areas are exceedingly important. And unfortunately, too often the United States has reverted to the military instrument. Vietnam, we went in for the wrong reasons. Afghanistan, we were going to impose a democratic system on a tribal society. And Iraq the second time over weapons of mass destruction that did not exist. So we have to be far more careful. If we're going to cry wolf, there better be a wolf. And too often, there haven't been. Why is the United States more concerned about an invasion of Taiwan by China than the Taiwanese are? Answer that question. I can't. So I think what we're going to see in the future, and a lot of it will depend upon how Ukraine is resolved. And my guess is that Ukraine will be resolved possibly along the lines of the Korean settlement instead of along the east-west lines of the uh, 38th parallel. This will be north-south longitudinal, probably something resembled the pre-February 24th, 2021 boundaries, because both sides are going to be exhausted. And I think what you're going to see is a competition that becomes far greater between the United States and China. Um, and I think what you'll have during the Cold War, we had peaceful coexistence. This is what Nikita Khrushchev wanted. It was coexistence. I think this will be dangerous coexistence, that both sides, the United States and China, know that they have to coexist. But there's going to be more friction. It's going to be more difficult. And I think as a result, the peoples of both China and the United States are going to suffer simply because uh, we cannot come to some kind of rapprochement or some kind of true peaceful coexistence. And the politics in America are going to make that much more difficult because now you see among the Republican Party growing isolationism, which has been part of the, public, the Republican Party for you know 100 years. So it's going to be very, very difficult to predict how this 